I talk with Karen on this series of Pooches at Play, but I thought I would share some extra questions and insights on our social media platforms. Uh, so thank you again for spending some extra time with us, Karen. Now, we have some follower questions here people are wanting to know. And of course, one of the first ones is, what is the best cancer busting foods for our dogs? <laughs> Best cancer busting foods would be pesticide free foods. We know that pesticides are damaging to our dog's DNA. So try and feed as much unsprayed food as possible. Number one, number two, try and feed as much minimally processed food. And what we mean by that is having a lifetime of highly refined foods also means that our dogs are continually ingesting the byproducts of the high heat food processing, which in and of itself, those advanced glycation end products are not good in terms of overall health and well-being and certainly contribute to increased cancer rates. So minimally processed food is, is healthier in the sense of being less carcinogenic. But obviously foods that are high in polyphenols and naturally occurring antioxidants are really important. Those are the, those living whole foods that contain the bioactive molecules, which are where, really where the magic comes in being passed up the food chain to give our dogs what they need for health, build DNA repair, scavenging free radicals, and then the minimum of, of tissue damage. So for instance, things like broccoli. Broccoli contains sulforaphane, which can quell free radicals by 73%. It contains glucoraphanin, which protects your DNA. It includes dienedol methane for dogs, which actually prevent against endocrine disrupting hormones from being activated in their system. Turmeric contains curcumin, which does literally a dozen different amazing things in a dog's body. Blueberries have phytochemicals that prevent DNA damage. So all of these fresh living foods coming out of our refrigerator can be healthfully shared with our dogs and should be as a means of naturally helping their bodies be provided with the resources they need to be able to scavenge um, free radicals as they need to in this day and age. Purdue University actually had a really awesome study that just adding in some dark green leafy vegetables three times a week with Scottish Terriers reduced their incidence of bladder cancer by over 70%. So just adding a little bit of fresh living whole foods goes a long way. Yes, I read that study. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, just a little bit what we could do. And also we want to lightly steam them, don't we? Or have them all pulped so that it can be digested. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Helps with helps with bioavailability. That's right. Now we talk a lot on the show about the benefits of feeding raw versus kibble. I mean, for us, it's a bit of a no brainer, but for people out there who really aren't quite convinced or aren't sure, you know, top line, what do you think the benefits are? Well, I think the same benefits, it doesn't matter if you're nourishing your two-legged kids or your four-legged kids, healthful wellness practitioners are going to say, minimize how much ultra processed food you're feeding your family, maximize how much fresh living whole food that you can identify as food. Like it's really important that we can see and know what we're eating. The same is true for how we are nourishing our animals. So a bunch of benefits, but certainly the antioxidants and polyphenols coming from fresh whole life foods are amazing. And the more that they are high heat processed, the less of those key bioactive molecules are in real healthy foods. So minimally processed foods just contains more healthful substances that nourish the body uh, over a lifetime. The second big, I think, point that, that is important is the high heat processing diminishes nutrients that requires pet food manufacturers then to add those vitamins and minerals, just the basics back in. But just because we're adding in synthetics doesn't put back in all those amazing polyphenols and phytonutrients that come from real whole live foods in their unadulterated state. And that the last but not least would be microbiome enhancement. We know that the diversity coming from a lot of different fresh whole foods nourishes our dog's gut in a way that really is second to none. And so the more diversity, the fresher the foods we can provide and the more variety, we're really doing our part in nourishing our dog's microbiome in a way that allows for resiliency to come through. That's right. Looking after their gut like our own. <laughs> is, uh, now, uh, someone has asked, would a dog with a slightly sensitive stomach benefit from a raw diet? <laughs> I, I'm a big believer that all of life two-legged, four-legged benefits from minimally processed foods. Now, if you or your dog or your children of any kind have IBS, IBD, sensitive tummy, mm -hmm. you would want to introduce fresh whole foods 
gently and slowly. And you may want to start by, you know, poaching them or steaming them and then moving slowly to a more natural or unadulterated uncooked state. And the pace at which we transition dogs with unhealthy guts is a lot slower. Yes. But the point is most of life benefits from minimizing highly refined foods and increasing the amount of fresh, whole, nourishing foods that have been minimally processed or adulterated. Mm, that's right. And normally it's about, you know, transitioning across to raw food from kibble, probably about 14 days with a sensitive stomach, would you say even longer? Oh my goodness. I have some, I have some animals that have, that have terrible IBD that also have concurrent food allergies that I have taken six months to wean them onto to yes. fresh. Food. So it's not a race and we have to nourish our dogs anyway. So we might as well work slowly at not rocking the boat, not creating any new symptoms, but slowly work at rebuilding gut health while diversifying the diet through a very slow transition that allows the body to adapt as different nutrients come in. That's right. And of course, talking to your vet to get some help with that is a one, one that does support raw food diets, of course, but we'll come to that in a sec. Um, what advice would you give to Australian pet parents? I know, I know you're aware of some of the products out here and stuff and um, are very passionate. When they're picking or anyone really is looking for a pet food brand, what should they be looking for? Ooh, good question. Well, first of all, disregard the brand because companies sell people, you know, products change, ingredients change. We're not going to be committed to a brand. I highly recommend, and what I teach in the Forever Dog is what we call pet food homework, which means you have to know enough. We have to be empowered enough guardians to be able to do our pet food homework, which is um, how biologically appropriate is the food, which is basically the carb equation. Don't, you know, if we're feeding 30, 50, 40, 60% starch, that's a whole lot of sugar. So we want to be able to do the carb equation and figure out how biologically appropriate the diet is. Number two, do a, do that adulteration math equation, which means what's the intensity of the processing and therefore what remaining nutrients are coming from real whole foods versus synthetics or synthetic vitamins and minerals. And last but not least, you will do synthetic nutrition addition, which is really identifying are the nutrients in your dog food coming from lab-made vitamins and minerals or from real whole fresh, fresh foods? Mm -hmm. So by you doing pet food homework on either the food that you're feeding, the food you want to feed, or if you're kind of cross comparing brands and you're going to com compare A, B, and C brands, you would be able to do pet food math across all three of those pet yeah. food brands and be able to decide what's best for your dog. Yes. Um, and also, you know, a lot of people don't realize, oh, they're adding the chemicals. I mean, the chemicals, <laughs> the uh, the vitamins and minerals back into the product, right. as those dry ones. However, they're not a complete vitamin and mineral anyway, are they, when they're added in that way? So we need exactly. to be, make sure not being misled by that. Uh, someone has asked here, this is quite the question, given the increased bioavailability of nutrients from fresh whole foods, if raw pet food manufacturers are required to meet the same standards, so in America, obviously AFCO in Europe, um, FEDIF, uh, we don't have uh, set standards here in Australia, unfortunately, as yet. Um, if they're trying to meet them the same as kibble does, our dry food, how likely is it that our pets may end up consuming much higher levels of nutrients that, that they require? And is, in, is there any harm in that? Now, I'll just simplify the question for perhaps people that aren't. Um, so with these standards, people, uh, pet food manufacturers are required to put in certain levels of different, in a kibble, for example, they have to add in back those synthetic, uh, those vitamins and minerals to a certain degree. So I guess this question is saying that if a fresh food manufacturer isn't adding them in at that same level, are they being penalized and, and, or if they then have to add some more in, is that dangerous? This is an excellent question, and it's especially important for countries that don't have minimum nutrient requirements. So both Canada and Australia, you do not have a national AFCO or FEDIAF that says, which dictates that if you produce a dog or cat food, that there should be a nutritional adequacy statement on the label. So here in the US, pet foods have to say this food has been approved for growth, for lactation, gestation, or for all life stages. And same with Europe, but in Canada and in Australia, you have to trust the pet food manufacturer. And what we are seeing sadly, 
is because the fresh food industry is booming. It's the fastest growing industry worldwide. We are seeing fresh food manufacturers producing suboptimal diets, just like ultra processed pet foods are producing potentially suboptimal diets. So I think the key is here is to scrutinize your pet food manufacturer. The questions you want to ask any manufacturer, whether it's raw, cooked, freeze-dried, dehydrated, semi-moist, canned, or extruded, dry, air-baked, um, however, whatever the category you're feeding, the question is, can you send me a nutritional analysis so I can see what nutrients in your pet food? And the reason that is so important is that in Australia, if the manufacturer says that they're using whole foods to meet a canine's minimum nutritional requirements. Now this is different. National requirements are one thing, but we do know without a shadow of a doubt, we've done enough research to know the bare amounts of vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, proteins, fat, EFAs necessary to sustain life for dogs. And what no one wants to do is an experiment in their kitchen with a pet food brand thinking that they're feeding everything that their dog needs only to determine that they are either being undernourished or in this, in the, in the question uh, that your reader or that your, your, your subscribers submitted, what happens about too many nutrients? So I think there again, the key is to do your pet food math and that synthetic nutrition equation is going to be very enlightening. If your raw food manufacturer is using whole foods to meet a dog's minimum nutritional requirements, the food is going to be quite expensive because things like zinc can be difficult. It's a hard to come by nutrient that, that can just be difficult. However, the, the question, the person asking the question is a really viable point. For instance, if you're feeding a raw beef-based diet that also has an ample amount of beef liver and beef heart, that red meat is rich in copper and in iron, which means the copper and iron and minimum nutritional requirements are being met through whole foods. Bravo. But then if that manufacturer adds in additional copper and iron, that's when you can actually go from optimal nutritional requirements to toxic nutritional yeah. requirements, but that happens only with synthetic additions, fresh, whole food. It's really hard yes, to yes. tox out an animal unless you have a growing puppy or you're feeding, you're only feeding one type of food. Like you're feeding four pounds of beef liver. That can be a problem yes, both yes. for, you know, with vitamin A alone, but if you're feeding optimal amounts of raw whole foods and you're not using synthetics, you have nothing to worry about. The biggest issue we're seeing now is fresh food manufacturers are saying that they're producing nutritionally complete foods and they are not. And so actually nutritional deficiencies with raw food diets are becoming a problem because some countries don't have minimum nutritional requirements. And therefore those pet food manufacturers are not formulating to any standard. And then that's when we can see long-term nutritional deficiencies come about. So I think the key is regardless of what company you're partnering with or what type of food you're feeding, we strongly recommend that you email the company and ask for a nutritional analysis. So you can see for yourself what nutrients are in the food or are not in the food. That's right. And, you, you know, that's why we work with who we work with because, you know, it's open, transparent. We can go into the factory. We can see the food, you know, and know that it is actually real whole food. So that's, yeah, that's so important. So as we always say, don't believe everything that you see on TV or read on a label, but believe what you see on this TV. Um, <laughs> why are some, this is another question, why are some senior dogs switch from raw food to a cook diet? And I guess what sign do you look out for with senior dogs? And I'm afraid that's you, Das, um, uh, to know what you should be doing and how do you pick a good cooked food? Well, how you pick a good cooked food is exactly how you pick a good dehydrated food or freeze-dried food or even a good kibble. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you go back to that pet food homework because the goal for all of us as guardians is to feed the best food we can afford to feed. But what that means is that we know enough to be able to discern, is it biologically appropriate, where the nutrients come from, and, uh, and how many times has the food been adulterated? If you can walk through your choices for feeding a senior dog, you will come up with a good, better, best list of options for the foods that you have available, and that's going to allow you to discern what food is going to be best for your senior. Some seniors, a lot of seniors, end up having poor digestion, they end up with a little bit of either dysbiosis or leaky gut, or their GI tracts just don't assimilate, break down, or absorb and process food as they used to do. 
And so on occasion, sometimes older animals by denaturing the food, which means basically cooking it, which yeah. breaking down the food, which is what happens when we cook it, does it make the food less nutritious? Sure. But it also denatures and breaks down the food, allowing it to be potentially a little bit more easier for seniors to digest. Now, I don't automatically put seniors on any different food. I always let their bodies talk to me when I'm dealing with, I have a lot of seniors as a proactive wellness veterinarian, because that is when people say, I want, I'm going to institute things to intentionally create wellness because I do not want my senior to break. So yeah. if you have a senior, now is an excellent time to begin being an impound guardian and making great decisions to slow degeneration through this next chapter of a senior's life. So I would not automatically switch foods, but if you are finding that your dog's body is telling you through symptoms, belchy, gassy, farty, maybe you're seeing undigested food in the stool, maybe you're seeing more GI symptoms, that's, that is a good time for you to talk to your functional medicine veterinarian about, hey, maybe my, maybe my dog's pancreas isn't up to par, maybe I should be adding some digestive enzymes, or instead of using probiotic and prebiotic foods, maybe I should switch to a more potent supplement, or maybe I need to generate gently poach my dog's food now to help with the assimilation process. So the key is you want to customize a dietary protocol around your individual senior and don't cookie cutter anything because your senior may roll into his geriatric use years beautifully eating an entirely raw diet. And that would be the goal. Yeah, absolutely. And personally, then I know a lot of our viewers and um, social media followers love your work. Um, again, do check out the Forever Dog book. But what made you decide to take this path? I mean, obviously, there are vets that are a bit hesitant towards raw food diets. Um, we, we talk about that a bit on the show as well. But what made you take the holistic approach and the wellness approach? Mm -hmm. Well, Proactive wellness means that we are intentionally making wise lifestyle decisions before disease occurs. Mm -hmm. So I did that because a, it's a whole lot less heartbreak for me as the treating doctor. It's a whole lot less heartbreak for my clients who are, are doing everything they can to prevent disease and degeneration from occurring. But most importantly, it dramatically improves our animals, our pets quality of life by us keeping our animals at a thriving level and not allowing them to degenerate and then decide, oh my gosh, my animal's broken. How do I fix my animal? proactive wellness or functional medicine doctors intentionally put together lifestyle protocols that dynamically change over the course of your animal's life to actually prevent degenerative disease from occurring. And if we can prevent degeneration from occurring, we all have better quality lives. And that to me is just what I would call common sense medicine. Yes, and must be much nicer as a vet to see your yes. older clients come in, the little dogs coming in in good health, um, rather than suffering all those terrible diseases. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, both on the show and here with us on our socials. It's been wonderful to talk to you. We love your work. If you'd like to find out more about The Forever Dog, visit theforeverdog.com. Um, we're going to be chatting to Rodney as well on the show and here on socials. So thank you again. And as I said, I hope to see you in person one day soon. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs>